Good morning and welcome to New Covenant Worship Center. We are so happy you're able to join us today for service. I want you to sit back, relax, enjoy the presence of the Lord, and be blessed. And we'll see you at the end of the program. Be 
participants, participants of his work. So shake it off this morning, whatever's finding you. Shake it off. Shake it off and be a participant of his work today, of his glory today. You know what, God, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm here to praise you. And you know what? Maybe you came pumped this morning. Maybe you came expecting this morning. Is your neighbor? Is your neighbor? You know what? You can get your neighbor excited too, even if they're coming at love day. You know what, Miss Jenny? We can worship Jesus together. So we're going to sing this again. Proclaim in Jesus' name those things you are looking for. Proclaim our seats are filled. Proclaim souls are one for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we proclaim in Jesus' name. Walls fall down in Jesus' name. Strong bones break in Jesus' name. Amen.
chapter 8. Some very familiar scripture. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. When you are called 
according to God's purpose. You are submitted to him in every area of your life. It's the, it's the old expression. If he's not your Lord of all, he's not your Lord at all. When we, when we are totally sold out, totally devoted to this kingdom that we are called into, this kingdom that we've been called out of the world into, and to this system of kingdom living, not the Babylonian system that the world dwells in, that the world manipulates, but the kingdom of God that is governed by seed, time, and harvest. It is governed by the law of the kingdom. The law that says, when you give, it will be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom. That's the word of God. That's the law. That is a law of the kingdom. As we give today, as we sow, sow with purpose, give with purpose. In the book of Ruth, we read how Ruth was gleaning in Boaz's wheat field. And Boaz this wasn't where I'm going to go this morning. But when Boaz saw her, he told his workmen, don't rebuke her. In fact, leave handfuls of purpose for her to pick up, for her to glean. I encourage you today, be about a kingdom purpose, especially in your giving. Not just your tithing, but your giving, your sowing. Because we know if you sow, you're going to reap. You're going to reap greater than what you have sowed because that's a law of kingdom, of the kingdom. It's the law that says whatever you put in the ground, whatever you tend to, whatever you care for, it's going to come back greater. We know in the book of Genesis, Isaac sowed in one year, sowed in double famine, and reaped in that same year a hundredfold harvest. When the world system was burning down around him, when people were starving all around him, Isaac put the favor of God to work, put the law of the kingdom to work. Wasn't even a farmer, a shepherd by trade. But in the year that he sowed, he reaped a hundredfold harvest. doesn't matter your opposition it doesn't matter whoever saw that have you ever seen that movie Sergeant York about Alvin C. York from Tennessee one of the most decorated heroes of World War I and his family were kill people they, 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 they tried to farm the upper land the hills and then where they're from, everyone else, the, the rich and the affluent, they, they farmed in the valleys. You know, nice, straight furrows. The York family, they, they tilled on the hillside and around boulders. And if they, if they had a straight row, it was you know, never on purpose. The, you know, before the, the ground would yield a harvest, it yielded rocks. That's just... They sowed in spite of their obstacles because they had to. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, in verse 6, it says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel 
have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Zerubbabel. Talk about a person of prophetic destiny in the Old Testament. Led back, led back the first trip of the children of Israel out of captivity. They, they weren't even born in Israel. They were born in Babylon. But God sent them back. And when they went back, this man's purpose was to rebuild God's temple. And that was, he was about the kingdom. His purpose was the kingdom. And God said, yes, he's put this first stone to it, and he will see it through. Don't despise the day of small things. You have sowed, you have sowed, you have sowed. You've sowed in crooked furrows, you've sowed around stones. You've sowed in rough hilly country, and you're waiting for your harvest. What I'm telling you is, as soon as you see that first blade penetrate the surface of the earth. No, it's not your harvest in hand, but it's the start, it's the start of your yield. It's the start of the harvest. That first blade that comes through is every much a corn stalk as that seven foot stalk just full, he heavy, weighed down with e fat, juicy ears of corn. It's still corn. It's still your harvest. Don't despise. When that when that first blade pops through the earth, celebrate it. Thank you, God. I see my harvest. No, it's not ready for me to eat yet, but I see it. I'm protecting it. I'm guarding what you've given me. I have sowed. I have placed it into your kingdom for your purpose. That's why we're sowing. We're seeking first the kingdom of God. Zerubbabel didn't go to Jerusalem to build himself a house. He went to Jerusalem to build God a house. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Not called for my agenda, not called for the thing I think needs corrected, not called for the justice I think needs to happen, called for God's purpose. We have to love him. If we love him, we keep his commandments. That's what he told us in John chapter 15, or 14, excuse me, verse 15. If you love me, Keep my commandments. Keep my law. Work the law of the kingdom. Take advantage of what God has given you. Take advantage. And be about kingdom business. When we obey him, in Deuteronomy chapter 28 it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God doesn't matter what obstacle you're facing whether your mountains physical whether your mountain spiritual whether the mountain is your relationships with others whether the mountain is just something that's a general opposition to you in your life. God says, when you live, when you love me, when you live according to my purpose, the mountain will become a plain, and you will complete your purpose before him. The 
project and purpose that he has had you lay foundation to, you're going to bring forth that capstone, that finality, with shouts of grace, grace to it, unmerited favor, because God's done it. Amen? If you have If you're not a sower, I encourage you. Um, I beg you, not for our benefit, but participate and be a sower because God wants to bless you. God has abundance stored for you. His good treasure that he wants to pour out to you, pour out through you and be a blessing to others. If we're ready to give this morning, if you're writing a check, please make it payable to MCWC. If you're watching at home and want to participate and God you know, touched your heart with the message today, please consider participating and just send your gift to New Covenant Worship Center, PO Box 847, Jackson, Ohio, 45640. And, you know, expect, celebrate when you see that first leaf break through the surface of the earth defying gravity praise him amen if you have your gift once you get it out let's hold it before him today as we do our offering declaration from a standpoint of qualification to declare is one thing to, do, from a, to be qualified to do so is another so if you have your gift, just hold it before him and declare together. Upon the authority of God's word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, men will give to me. I am a tither. I bring my tithe into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not room enough to receive it. I live in the season of prosperity. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises bills paid off debts canceled royalties received my whole family saved and walking with god in perfect health and abundance walking in divine favor and blessing i am blessed coming in i am blessed going out all that i do prospers now in jesus name amen
Isn't he good? He's so good. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I want you to know that while we're here, it's like you've come into the place and you've got to your table, no matter where you are. So I want you to be unrestricted and I want you to be free. Don't you worry about the cameras. Don't you worry about the view that we get, the things that are going on. If you feel like you need to be in the front of the church, the altar of the Most High God, you come. I don't care when it is. You participate and you, you take part in what's going on. The people that are seated around you are now with you and you're with them. Everyone in this sanctuary. If you feel like you need to shake someone's hand, you feel free to do so. Okay? We're all in the same party. Take care of the same things in the house of the Lord. And what I'm seeing is people trying to get unrestricted in the house of God, and yet feeling the limitations of the things that have been placed upon us unduly. We're in a safe place. Jesus is with us. And so I want you to be free and unrestricted in the house of the Lord. You feel like you need to run or shout, jump up and down, shake somebody or hug them, unless they tell you not to, you do what God tells you to do. Amen? You know, leprosy is contagious. Highly contagious. So contagious that uh, social distancing didn't get it done. You had to live separate. While the family lived at home, the lepers had to live outside the camp. Till one day, this man named Jesus, this God the Son, this Son of Man and Son of God, came walking through a city, and the lepers, covering the hideousness of their running sores, their body parts falling off, and the very spread of the disease and the breath that they breathe, stood on the outside of the village, crying out, Jesus. <laughs> he wasn't wearing a mask, didn't have any gloves on, didn't change his clothes, had no PPE, and he walked over to them because they could not come to him. And like anyone would do, said, what is it that you want from me? One of the lepers said, if you are willing, you can make me clean, make me whole. Jesus did the untouchable. He violated every principle of the mask, every principle of the gloved hand, and he reached out and he touched the leper, which made him legally, socially, and religiously unclean. And when he touched the leper, he said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And the leprosy departed. It didn't get on Jesus, it left both of them. Then Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Make the offering you need to make. Go show yourself to the priest. I do not believe in disobedience. I do not believe in defiance. But there is not a legislative past appointed law in the land that says we have to do anything that we're doing. And we have with everything that we have tried to do to our own hurt and demise tried to comply. We are here this morning to worship the Lord in His house. We believe that He is protecting us, that He will protect us. But none of these things 
from the pandemic to anything else has the right to attach itself to our bodies. And we're going to stand in that. So I am not telling you today to be defiant, to be disobedient, but I am telling you you're, you're, in, you're in Papa's house. And while you're here, you feel free to do whatever you're comfortable with. Now, should someone new come in that we don't know, that feels a little apprehensive, we'll give them time to get used to us and our ways and let them see how free that it can be. But I'm tired of the restrictions. Don't you worry about the cameras. If you decide that you have to get up in front of the camera and you don't want in there, I have a great media department and a wonderful editor, and I can make sure that you're bleeped out if you don't want in there. Well, don't you worry about what goes on in this house. You feel like you need to demonstrate for Jesus, you do it. And for God's sake, you want to use this altar before, during, or after the invitation. You avail yourself of the altar of God. Enough's enough. This is where we are. I love you, and I appreciate you, and I thank God for you. Now give the Lord a hand clap of praise and be seated in His presence. Please be seated. I want to talk to you for a little while this morning about the faith of our friends. And I've preached all over these things and around them and here, there, and yonder. But God spoke to my heart again. And I just wanted to, to, to make sure that you understand. Uh, God, please help me not to get sidetracked. <laughs> uh, that's hard for me, you know. I'm a rabbit hunter at heart, so rabbit trails are important to me, all right? And, uh, but I try not to do that. I want to try to stay focused with, I want to try to keep us in the time that we can, that would be a good and reasonable amount of time for us uh, to do the things that we need to do. But how can I say this and um, Make sure that everyone that hears it here and everyone that will listen to this around the world understands how clearly I mean what I'm saying. Um, John and I have been out walking and doing different things. We walk all over the place and choose different places to go for the different terrain and different things of that nature just to get our exercise in. And we were walking down the road over here in a different place. And as we were walking down the road, there was a gentleman sitting on his front porch with his uh, pad, his iPad, his tablet, whatever. And he saw us and he was watching us as we were walking down the road. He got up close to him, began to shake his pad, and he said, I've been watching. I've been, I've been watching your live stream, been watching what's going on. I want you to know I really enjoy it. And I thought, wow. I was listening, talking to my dear friend up in the Northeast in Connecticut, he said, Bishop, I'm watching every Sunday. And uh, there are people watching everywhere. And, and I'm finding more and more people say, because, you know, uh, I'm saying some controversial things that are not uh, fitting with the plan. But what I'm finding is people saying, I want you to know I agree with you 100%. Some people have a great platform, because, but because of the fear of that platform, they, they don't feel they can speak. Um, I have a platform, too. Probably ought to be more concerned about it. It might fill up five or six churches if I get more concerned about it. But you know what? The truth is more important to me than the number. And so I'm going to tell the truth. So I've been thinking about it. I want to talk to you about the faith of our friends, but I want to tell you how important it is that we need one another. And at the bottom of everything that is going on is separation and alienation in our society. Wear a mask so nobody knows who you are. And say what you want to about how protective the mask is, but it is not. You're being lied to. Are you a doctor? No, I don't need to be a doctor. I just, do they have benefits? Sure they do. If I clean the commode, I put on a pair of plate test rubber gloves. I'm, I'm not against that. When I went into 
for my children to be born, I wore masks and gloves because we needed to do that. You know, I'm not telling you that, you know, if you're walking into the hospital and somebody's got MRSA, you don't need to, to, to protect yourself. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when it comes to viruses and all these different kind of things like H1N1 and, uh, you know, coronavirus and all that, if you think that the mask in any way is helping you, you are willingly being deceived because it's not. And the detriment to your body of wearing a mask continuously is reprehensible and they know it. And at the bottom of it, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you can't deny what's going on. So you wear a mask so nobody knows who nobody is. You separate people by six feet, double arm's length, away from everyone. Separate people while they're eating so they can't talk, they can't communicate. Separate people while they're in the store so they can't fellowship. And now we're coming to the place where they're getting integral about our homes. If there's any way that you can sleep in a separate bedroom from your spouse, you should. When you young and middle-aged and older couples that are still groovy and with it decide to get together together, you know, as nature intended, if you are a male and a female, which is what God intended, they're recommending that you wear a mask now while you do the deed. Ain't no one ever been that ugly. <laughs> All right, listen, I'm just telling you right here, right now, you got to get a little bit light with it as you go along so, you know, so that you don't get it there. But I want you to know that at the, at the bottom of all these things, and I'm not preaching conspiracy, I'm telling you what's happening. So you've got, we're, 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 we're separated at church, we're separated in the stores, we're separated now even in our own homes. If you comply. And people fighting with all those kind of things. And there are things that you must comply with. We have a highway behind us here. The posted speed limit on that highway is 60 miles an hour. It is a law. It has been legislatively passed. It is a law. You don't have to like it. You may love it, but it is a law. If you go up there and get on that highway in your car and go 61 miles an hour, you are being defiant. You are disobeying. It is a law. I say go 60 miles an hour. That's the law. If you do not do that, it is wrong. Everything we're being asked to do in the name of health, there is no law. Oh, but you have a mandate. A mandate is not a law. We are a country of laws. I'm not here to talk to you about the law. I'm not here to talk to you about conspiracy. I'm here to tell you that what is being done is we are being separated. And, and even if that was not the intention, it is the result. Until that there's no trust. Until that there's no camaraderie. Until that fellowship is being broken down. Not only in public and society, but in our homes. It is time to stand up and say, enough is enough. We are here. We are safe. And we need to know something. We need one another. We cannot afford to be separated. We need one another. You need your family. You need your friends. You need society. You need people in your life. You need to be able to touch. The most critical sensation of a newborn human being is the sense of touch. When the baby is born and the doctor delivers the baby and cuts the umbilical cord, they lay the baby up on the mother's breast because the most important need for that baby and the mother at that time is the sense of touch. Jesus said we were to lay hands on people. Amen. Amen. And now we're being told we can't lay hands on people. 
just one touch. The little woman had to touch the hem of his garment. Healing was not going to come to her any other way unless she could touch the hem of his garment. Somebody touched me. Jesus, when he was touched, felt virtue go from him when he was touched. We are being removed from, and what is being removed from us is the touch and the ability to associate and fellowship until now. We're so distant that even when we're together with one another and try to act familiar, it's like there's a distance, and it's not been built for any other reason except we've been staged apart. So people feel like there's problems in their home. You've got people that have been stuck together for the last seven months, six months, unable to leave, and divorce has gone through the roof. And the number one cause is we don't feel like we're connected. My God, you've been at home together for six months, unable to do anything except be together, and you're talking divorce? Not talking, you're getting it. Children say, my parents don't understand me. Parents saying, my children, and even though we're at home, we're not connected. You come to church and people are leaving and transferring. I need something new. I want to go somewhere else. And they go and they sit apart somewhere else. And it's because they're looking for the touch that they used to know, and it's no longer there. It's time to stop it. We need our friends. We need the faith of our friends. We must have one another. Jesus called his disciples, and when he sent them out, he sent them out two by two. Jesus could have walked alone, but he did not. He chose those to follow him and to go with him, and he surrounded himself with them continuously. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And a, a book was written, a book of remembrance before the Lord concerning those that loved him and that called upon him and sought him and, and, and spoke to one another. Church, we've got to do something about becoming connected again. We've got to trust and believe God. We've got to get up in our faith enough to understand that there's nothing that's going to touch us. If something does try to touch us, you need the faith of another to agree with you and cast it off you so that... See, one can only set a thousand to flight, but two, ten thousand. We need the faith of our friends, how important that it is that we have our friends. I am tired of the separation that has been caused. I can't do one thing about COVID-19 except pray it down to the pits of hell, and I do that daily. I cannot do one other thing about COVID-19 except declare that it will not touch my body or my family or my church family or those who are in association with me, that it burns in the pits of hell. That is what I am doing, but I can't do anything else about it. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can refuse from this day forward to be separated from those that I know that I need to be with. Go with me to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to read to you the 12 verses that are there. The faith of our friends is what I'm talking to you about. The Bible says it's good that if two are together because if one falls down, the other one can help him up. Amen? Two is better than one. Amen? I love it when they were walking to the road, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walked up and drew near to them. Everything about the Bible is coming close to God, drawing near to God. He said, draw close and near unto me, and I'll draw close and near unto you. And yet what's being driven into our hearts and minds today is how separate we need to be. And now they're even... They're even mocking the Lord. Churches that are putting up masked pictures of Jesus, saying if you come into this place to worship, you must wear a mask. Jesus would. Local churches. I'm not talking this. I'm talking about here. How foolish. Rabbit trail. Mark chapter 2. Verse 1 through 12, this is what the Bible says. 
And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. <laughs> Jesus attracted people. Uh, do you remember that the Bible says he healed all kinds of sicknesses and diseases? <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody remember that? Do you suppose any of them were contagious? Do you suppose any were turned away at the door because they were contagious? Did Jesus say, be careful, make sure you only take one robe or tunic, take your staff and your bag with you, and be careful to take your face mask? So in case that you get someplace where a virus is ravenous, you can throw that on and be protected. Hmm? Jesus attracted people. The Word of God attracts people. You can't attract people when you're not allowed to be with people when you attract them. We're about attracting people. You know what's going on in the church today it is, 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 is we can't attract anybody because we've got to limit the number, we've got to limit the time, we've got to limit the space, we've got to limit the distance. Mm -hmm. After some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. I come in this morning, and I was listening and participating in the praise and worship, and if I'm not mistaken, Jesus is in the house. Amen. Immediately in verse 2, many gathered together. Oh, but hold on a minute. They were limited to 10. No, no, no. Many were gathered together in the house. So that there was no longer room to receive them, nor ever near, not, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. My God, I'm glad for friends. It's hard enough when you can't even get in, and besides that, you're, you're, you're a paralytic. No way for you to get there. I'm glad he had more than one friend. Aren't you? I'm glad if they're going to pack me up on the roof, I got more than one friend packing me. I'm glad if when they get up on the roof, they're going to fool around and take the roof off, that I had more than one friend. Four friends. Now, we always laud the four men that carried him there, but how about the one man that needed Jesus so bad he got four friends in front of the master? Ever think about that? Jesus was not just there for the paralytic. As a matter of fact, the guy on the bed never moved him. Jesus was not moved because of the paralysis of the paralytic. What he saw was that the reason that everything happened is because this one paralyzed man was successful in getting four friends in the notice of the master. Think about it. That's an angle that don't get preached. Maybe you came with your need not because you're the one that needs it, but because four friends of yours, one friend of yours, two friends of yours had a meeting with Jesus that was more important than yours. So they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw how bad this guy was paralyzed, when Jesus saw how great his need was. No, the Bible says when he saw their faith. Who got noticed at this meeting with Jesus? The paralytic who was laying there on the bed or the four friends that Jesus ended up having the first meeting with? You see, you and I come to the Lord 
and we think that the need we're bringing is the most important reason. That's why we're here. Everyone focuses on the paralytic, but how about the four friends that Jesus noticed before he ever did anything for the paralyzed man? When he saw their faith. I want to throw this wrench at you. Who got who to Jesus on that day? The four men with strong legs that let down one paralytic in a bed? Or the one paralytic in the bed who had absolutely no strength or power to even get to Jesus by himself, but he got his four friends there. And when Jesus saw their faith, listen to this, then he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. What was, what, why did they bring him there? Because he was a, 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 a lush? Because he was a beer drinking, you know, lush? Because he was alcoholic? Because he was, you know, because he was a drug addict? Because he was a, a male whore? Why did they bring him to Jesus? Because he was a paralytic. He was sick. He was afflicted. He had cerebral palsy. He had you know, MS, MD. He had, he had something going on. He was paralytic. But you know what? Here again, we're here for one reason. Jesus never addressed his sickness. He said, your sins are forgiven. And do you know that the church got mad just like they do today? Well, you're not even addressing the problem. You won't even deal with the problem. You can't talk to these hard-headed conservatives. They won't deal with the problem. But what you see as the problem is not what God sees as the problem. I know, son, you're here to be healed, to be forgiven. I'm going to deal with your four friends first. I laud your faith. Praise God. Then he turns and says, I'm not going to deal with your sickness. I'm going to forgive your sins. Do you know that the person that really needs help is hiding what they need? And they'll put forth in their life whatever is the most visible thing that is there. And almost always, God won't deal with what you're giving him. Because that's not the problem. What is visible is the manifestation. It's the outcropping. It's the outcome. It's the manifestation of a problem that's laying much deeper. Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the, the scribes and the church was there. And in their hearts, he said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hmm. But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within, himself, within themselves, my God, do you see what's going on here? Do you, do you also understand and realize that the closer you get in proximity to, to God's children and the closer you get into proximity of Jesus when you're doing that, that God begins to re reveal things? You know, I was thinking about us being a Pentecostal church and how people are speaking in tongues and all the different things going. And I strongly recommend that because you know what? If you're, not, if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Ghost in your life. But do you realize why we have the Holy Spirit? Not only so that we're built up in our holy faith, not only so that we can communicate with God, but do you know when those tongues are coming forth and prophetic word is coming forth, the words of wisdom, words of knowledge are coming forth, it is there so that those that do not believe might be convicted in their heart? I want you to know that people come to church, you may not know this, but you've come to church to get told on. I know we've all come for the worship. I know, I know. We've all come for the praise and the shouting and the who and the feel good and the goosebumps. That's wonderful, but you know why we're here to get told on? Because there's not anybody here from the bishop to the back door that does not have secrets in their heart that need revealed. But, you know, I just, whoosh, whoo, I come for that. That's good. Get you some. Get you some of that. But we're here so that the secrets of our heart, Jesus said, but listen, this guy's here for healing. Don't you understand? He needs a miracle of healing. Do you not understand? I mean, you know, you, we, they, everyone was there to hear Jesus. Everyone was there because they knew what would Jesus would do. But the minute Jesus starts ministering, they all start judging whether he's right or wrong. Back up again. 
I didn't even get that. I said it and I didn't get it. They were all there to hear him. They were all there because of him. They were all there because Jesus was in the house and everybody came because Jesus was in the house. But the minute that he started ministering, because he was not ministering the way they wanted him to, they started judging. What kind of blasphemous idiot is this? See, Jesus is not here to give who, 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 to give us the goosebumps. He's not here just so we can feel good about the worship and the song and the dance and the program. He's here so that we can get close enough that the Holy Ghost can begin to reveal the secrets of our hearts. Well, I, I, don't, I don't want the secrets of my heart. Then when God starts dealing, tell him about it. If you tell him about it, he won't tell anyone else about it. You keep trying to hide it, keep trying to sit on it, keep trying to cover it up, he's going to tell it out. You know why? Because heaven's at stake. And this is why people don't want us close. Oh, you can come to church, but don't sing. You can come to church, but don't preach. Well, what are we supposed to do then? What exactly are we supposed to do? Sit and look at one another? I'm sorry, I can't see you. You got a mask on. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. You ever notice how, how easy Jesus is? He's so easy. He's like water. He's going to take the path of re least resistance. I could have went in and pronounced big things. I could have prophesied to you. I could have put you in four different lines, $1,000 gift, $500 gift, $100 gift, and I could have prophesied accordingly. How stupid. I mean, what were they there to see? They came to see him. He was the attraction. The paralytic wasn't the attraction. The four men with faith wasn't the attraction. Jesus was the attraction. But when he began to move, all of a sudden people were offended because he was telling on them. This whole episode was not about the paralytic and it was not about the four men that had faith. It was about the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the hedonistic religious crowd that was in the church, he wanted to expose them. And the only way to do that was to get the secrets of their heart known. And the only way to do that was to do things that would cause that they never even spoke it out. They were going to. They were going to leave and go to the cafe and talk about it over break. But before they could do that, before they could get to McDonald's and tear him apart, before they could go to KFC and discuss him over a chicken leg, Jesus told on them. That's why people don't like to stay in church. But tell you what, let's have a service that only lasts about an hour if we can because the less time we spend, the less amount of time there is for God to deal with things. How many of y'all remember in the old school church that sometimes you'd have church for two and a half hours, they would dismiss church, about half the congregation would go home, and then what would happen? All of a sudden, the Spirit of God would fall again, and some of the greatest miracles we've ever seen, some of the greatest services that we've ever had happened in that time, and God would just continue to move because the longer that we spend in his presence the longer that his light shines upon our lives we need friends and friends need us to bring us to the presence of the Lord now let me ask you this who got help that day everybody the paralytic the four friends that were rewarded for bringing him the one paralytic who got four friends in the presence of Jesus didn't know they were getting there for. They got accoladed because of their faith. He got healed because the Lord forgave his sins. The scribes and the Pharisees got told on. He didn't tell on them so he could shame them. He told on them so they could get their heart right. God doesn't reveal things about us. And the secrets of men's hearts are not revealed so that we can be shamed or humiliated, but so that he can be brought to the light and manifested so that he can be dealt with by the Spirit of God and no longer be an affliction and a crippling, paralyzing sin in your life. That paralytic wasn't the only one crippled that day. 
which is easier to say to the paralytic? I thought that was an interesting choice of words. Because the paralytics that Jesus was talking about here was not the man laying on the bed. Paralytic had no problem. He was about ready to get up and take his bed and run home with it. Paralytic had no problem. The guy's fake had no problem. You know who's problem? The paralyzed scribes, Pharisees that had issues in their hearts and were speaking against the Lord. They're the ones that were getting dealt with, and no one seems to know that. This whole issue, this whole issue was Jesus coming again to deal with those who didn't want anything to do with him. He said, what's easier to say to the paralytic? Who had a problem? Did the paralytic have a problem, Reverend Sam? Does anywhere here say the paralytic had a problem? The four guys of faith had no problem. So who had a problem? So when Jesus said, well, what's easier to say to the paralytic? Who was he talking about? Not the guy on the bed. He'd already healed him. It's done. The moment Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you, he was healed. But the scribes that were still murmuring in their hearts, they had a problem. And Jesus said, you're the ones that are paralytic. Now, what I'm to listen to me, if they could have received this, he was saying to them, let this touch you and I forgive your sins. Let's verify that. He said to the paralytic who was on the bed, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk. Verse 10, then he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Who was he talking to if he had to break and say, and then he said to the paralytic? He was talking to those who were paralyzed in their heart and didn't know it. I want to let you know I have power to forgive your sins. I have stirred by the Holy Ghost the demons that are resting in your life. I have stirred by the Holy Ghost the things that are captivating you and holding you bound generationally. And I want to let you know that I'm here today to deal with you. If you will receive it, I have power to forgive your sins on this earth. You're worried about the paralytic, but I'm here for you. When he finished talking to them, he said to the paralytic who was on the bed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Verse 12, immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. I am tired of coming to church and only dealing with the superficial. I want to come to church and have the Holy Spirit so manifest in our midst again, like we're used to Him doing, that nobody leaves here without that touch they need. We do this because we need the faith of our friends. Jesus will be in the house. It's up to you to come. Jesus will be in the house. It's up to you to get here and bring someone with you. Jesus will be in the house. It's up to you to let someone bring you, whatever that it is. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 15, the centurion's servant was healed of the palsy because the centurion came to Jesus to get healing for his servant. Thank God that someone's going to get us to Jesus. Now, I want you to know that the centurion's servant got healed, but who got dealt with that day? The centurion. Huh? The woman of Canaan's daughter. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 22, 38, she was healed and a demon came out. This mother came to get healing for her daughter. When she went home, she found out that her daughter had been healed from that hour. But who got dealt with that day? That precious mother. We need the friends. We need the faith of our friends because they helped get us to Jesus. But never mistake this. You are a friend too. You're just as much getting them to Jesus as they are to you. The nobleman's son 
in John chapter 4, verses 47 through 53, was healed from the point of death. The father came to get healing for his son. Can I tell you that his son got healed, but who got dealt with that day? It was the nobleman. Why do we need the faith of our friends? Because it is there, it is in that friendship, it is in that place where we come together to bring one another to Jesus Christ that we get dealt with ourselves. Make no mistake about it. When God uses me to deal with you, He's dealing with me. When God heals you, you lay your hands on me and God heals me because you laid your hands on me, God's going to deal with you too. He just doesn't do what the, the, he just doesn't have one touch. I'm going to finish with this. James chapter 5, verse 16. You can go there with me. I'm going to give you a new take on this. James chapter 5, verse 16. I don't want to go into the story of how much I love James. This is the Lord's Bubby. This is his brother. They had different daddies, but the same mama. Huh? Yeah. This guy grew up in the house of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love this guy, man. He becomes the first presiding bishop of the church that Jesus started, and he started out not wanting anything to do with Bubby's works. Huh? Yeah. James chapter 5, verse 16, this is what the Bible says. Confess your faults one to another. <laughs> oh, I don't believe we have to do that. Uh, I don't want no one to know my faults. Too late, we already do. You know, what amazes me is how you can live in the same house with someone for 30 years or you raise children for 18 or 20 years and they act like you don't know them. I even got adult kids that come around. It's like, you don't even know. I'm thinking, who do you think you are? Where do you think I can show you where you came from? <laughs> you think I don't know you? Oh, I know. I've been through a lot. I know like I ain't. Everything you've been through, I'll walk with you. I don't know you. People have been married 34 years. We just don't know one another no more. You're an idiot. You're both idiots. What do you mean you don't know one another? Problem is you know too much. I don't like to do that if I confess my faults. Let me tell you something, sweetheart. If you've been here very long at all, we already know. Ain't no sense me trying to hide from you. You know. I used to think, I don't know why people don't come and talk to me about it before they do that. You know, I know why, because they don't know what I'm going to say. Then people look at you and say, well, then you finally dress them down on something later on. They say, well, I didn't come talk to you because I didn't know what you was going to say. Now you are lying. The problem is not that you don't know what I'm going to say. The problem is you already know what I'm going to say. Everybody in this place that's been here for a while, no, we don't just know the cologne you wear. We know the stink that you have when you don't wear it. No, I'm telling you that's how close we are. When you get that intimate with people to where it's called friendship, when it's called family, don't be acting like they don't know something about you because they know everything about you. We're just putting up with it until God deals with it enough that he's going to take care of it. I don't know. <laughs> ain't got a place. Yeah, you got a place. You're in it. That's your place, saying you ain't got no place. When you want to change it, you can. Confess your faults one to another. I don't like to do that. I want everybody to know. Uh, we get hung up there. Let's, let's stop that for a minute and talk about it. It's really not about confessing your faults to one another. It's about the next line, and pray for one another. Now, what we do when someone confesses our faults is go back to the cafe. God help us. We go to McDonald's. We get in the living room, and we talk about their faults that they confessed. And that's not what we're supposed to do. You already knew it anyhow. They're just telling you what you already knew. But the next thing is, and pray for one another. How much do I need? If the Bible tells us to pray for one another, we must need somebody. I don't need nobody. I tell you what, I'm a full-grown man. I'll do what I want. I do what I want, when I want, how I want. I don't need nobody. I'm just, you, you're lying, you're lying, and lying on top of lying. We all need one another. 
It would be true. It would be wonderful if Adam could have said back in the beginning, I don't need nobody. I just need God. But Adam couldn't say that. Adam said, Mr. Lion's got Mrs. Lion. <laughs> Mr. Cow got Mrs. Cow. Mr. Horse got Mrs. Horse. Woe to me. I ain't got nobody. I wonder why Adam didn't pop up and say, I'm a full-grown man. I do what I want, when I want, how. And you know what? He'd have got by with it because that's exactly who he was. A full-grown man that did what he want, when he want, how he wanted, who he want, whatever it was. But it wasn't enough. So God said, tell you what we'll do, since I'm not enough for you. See, all he had was God. Adam, Adam thought God didn't know, but God knew. So tell me what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you to sleep. Instead of making a Mrs. Cow for you or a Mrs. Lion, although I'm sure that in our society today, people would love it if they could marry a cow or a lion. So tell me what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you to sleep, and I'm going to cut you open. And I'm going to take out one of your rib bones, and I'm going to fashion me a Mrs. Adam. I'm going to make her so much out of you and so much like you that there's nothing about her you won't know and nothing about you that she won't know. That's what the trouble is when we get out here and get to playing around and we join ourselves with people that we're not married to. We're not supposed to be with because we, we create a soul tie, a spiritual thing that happens because and yeah, some, of you, some of you need to break some soul ties from back before you were even married. Generationally, things are hanging on to you that you need to get rid of because you don't understand that you're a spiritual creation. So he made Mrs. Adam and called her Eve because Adam needed somebody. Do you see the pattern? God needed somebody, so he made Adam. Adam needed somebody, so he made Eve. The last command that Jesus gave us concerning agreement on this earth, he said, were any two of you well, touch and agree is asking anything. You got one husband and you got one wife. That's two. They become one flesh. If two of you will touch and agree is asking anything, they shall ask on this. Or it will be done by my Father which is in heaven. We need the faith of our friends. Confess your faults. Well, I'm not just talking about your husband, or your wife. I need you. I need to be able to tell you. Listen, Kim, I'm having some problems with some things. Some thoughts are coming into my mind and my heart. Some things are affecting my life and my body. Would you pray with me about that? I need to be able to, you know, I don't need to go into the gore and the detail of it necessarily, but I need to be able to come to you and know that you care enough about me that if I tell you, I need you to pray. You don't go and say, Bishop just told me he's thinking about killing five people. I didn't say that to you. I'm not thinking about killing five people. Let me get that on the camera. I ain't killing nobody. People will go and then they'll make a story. Well, so-and-so told me this. They didn't tell you anything. They just asked you to pray for them. What we do when we have friends, if we're not careful, is we don't do what the Bible commands us to do. We take what they told us. We make something out of it that's not so instead of praying for them. I don't need friends that are going to become enemies. I need friends that are going to pray for me. Pray for me, why? That I may be healed. Get him, God. Oh, I've been waiting for him to ask me to pray for him. God let his brakes go out going down here. You know what I'm saying. You know, no, 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 that's not how we pray. Pray that I might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We need the faith of our friends. We cannot live without the faith of our friends. We must have the faith of our friends. We've got to have those that will stand near us and I want you to know that in the end of all of this, I'm not going to quote the scripture to you, but I'm going to quote about it to you. Jesus said that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We've always associated that with him, and I think it's appropriate to do so. But understand this. Understand this. We must have the faith of our friends. We cannot be separated. We must stop the separation. We're not being defiant. We're not being unhealthy. We're not being unholy. We're not being rebellious, but we must come together because we need one another. We need to get up in the house of God and praise Him and worship Him. We need to come up in Him unmasked, unencumbered. 
I'm not telling you if you want to wear a mask, you can't wear one. That's up to you. But I'm telling you that what we've got to do is come out from behind all of that and we've got to praise. We need the touch. We need the word. We need the presence of Christ. Not only so we can return to normalcy, but so that the Spirit of God can move and direct our lives. There is a word right here. Let that come forward. Hear me, says the Lord God. For yea, I say unto thee, that I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Yea, I say I am forevermore with thee, saith the Lord God. I am in thy midst to say that I might do a mighty work for thee. I say fear not for nothing by any means shall harm you, saith the Lord God. Oh, my candy, dee, 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 oh, show, na, na, dee, 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 oh, show. E no, 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 she, no, show, my candy, dee, 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 oh, show. E no, no, she, no, show, my candy, dee, 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 oh, show. I say that I've come to give thee life and that much more abundantly. I say fear not, fear not what man may say or do to thee, saith the Lord God. For I'm the Lord thy God, and I change not, saith the Lord God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I am in thy midst, saith the Lord God. I say, praise me, worship me, saith the Lord God. For yea, 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 saith the Lord God. I am here that I might do a mighty work with thee this day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We need the continuous moving of God in our house. We need to stand up in the middle of Pentecostal power. We need to stand up in the midst of the word of faith. We need to stand up and declare and decree the, the connectivity that we must have. And when we come into the house of God, I cannot tell you how to live your life at home, I, although I should be. I cannot tell you how to live in the store, but I can tell you when we come into Daddy's house, we need to be free and unencumbered. Amen. I'm going to be wise. I'm going to be wise. Be full of wisdom. You come in here vomiting with a high fever and coughing. All I'm going to tell you. Let's pray for you and let you go home and rest. I said I'm going to pray for you. And if you don't get your healing when I pray for you, go home and rest. But I'm going to believe God to heal you. And when you come up in the house of God, you need to know that we're protected here. Church, if we're not protected here, then there is no protection. So stand. And then let God stir you. I'm here this morning and I'm preaching to you, but God's stirring me. I'm here this morning and I pray that God is revealing to your heart things you need to talk to Him about. But God is revealing to my heart things that I need to talk to Him about because that's what He does. I'm here because you brought me here this morning. And you're here like it or not, because I brought you here this morning. But the reason we're all here is because he's here this morning. So why would we leave without his touch? Would you stand up with me right now? Father, give us your help right now, your direction right now, your wisdom right now. Give us your strength. Have you ever noticed when you're in the house of God and the word's coming forth, or maybe you're even in your own home and you're talking the word of God, you'll be talking about one thing, but in your heart there's other things that begin to go on. God begins to reveal things. It might, might be about your spouse, might be about a friend or a neighbor, it might be about your children, it might be about a job, it might be about society. But while you're talking on the Word of God, reasoning the Word of God, or just talking about the Lord, all of a sudden, God begins to deal in your heart and in your life. That's, that's, that's no different than what happens here. I, I'm well aware that while we're preaching the Word of God and teaching the Word of God, God is beginning to deal with things, and it may be, listen to me, it doesn't bother me if you lose focus on what I'm saying if God's given you an answer that you've been praying about for a long time. What else would He do? Sometimes it's only in that place where the Spirit of God is interjecting the Word of God so powerfully, whether it seems to be that powerful or not, that God gets you free enough that He can answer you something you've been praying about for years. So I'm not worried about people's distractions. 
I've never been worried about people. I get worried if people are playing. But I expect people to be a little distracted when the Spirit of God is moving because that's when God begins to deal with their heart and their mind about things they've been communicating. Do you see, when you came because of Jesus, when you came to hear me, when I came to minister to you, not only did we get the benefit of what we bring one another as friends, but Jesus then has the opportunity to, to give us what we couldn't seem to get at home, what we couldn't seem to get in the car. There's something about being in the presence. There's something about the gathering together. There's something about when people come together and the Spirit of God begins to move. Things get pointed out and called out. God's not here to embarrass or hurt or offend. He wasn't there that day just to heal that paralytic man. I got tied up in that. Sister Jess, it doesn't take much to tie me up, I don't suppose, but I, a cartoon can baffle me. But I was reading that and I thought, I, I've preached it so many times, I've taught it so many times, I've, and, and I'm so thankful that God, the paralytic guy got healed, and He's got his sins forgiven. I'm so thankful that those four friends were there. But we totally missed the conversation that he had with the scribes. When he literally told them, I want you to know I'm here to forgive your sin today. While you're arguing about who I am, while you're arguing about what power I have, and you're upset because I told this man his sins were forgiven, you don't need to be jealous. I'm here to forgive your sins if you'll believe on me. That's what he told them. So who got who to Jesus that day? Well, God got everybody to Jesus, and Jesus got everybody to himself. He'll stop looking at the obvious. Even in your own life, there's that thing that stands out front. That you stop looking at that. That's not the issue. Way down inside, there's a voice whispering. You need, you need the faith of friends to get you so unencumbered about what's so obvious that you can begin to hear God talk about. Oh, he, he said, paralysis is not your problem, son. Sin is. Here's how I'm going to deal with your paralysis. You're forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I'm led to believe that if Jesus would have said, Arise and walk, not one scribe would have had a problem. I'm led to believe that if Jesus had not acknowledged the four friends' faith, not a problem would have arisen. But he started talking about forgiving sin, and people with sin in their heart got stirred up. That's what he was dealing with. He didn't deal with them so he could convict them or condemn them. He dealt with them so he could forgive them. When God's dealing with your heart, don't get mad at the messenger. Don't get mad at the Spirit of God. Don't get mad. God's dealing with that because He wants to forgive it. He wants to heal it. He wants to unparalyze you. Our society teaches us, teach us to get mad and everybody messes with our stuff. Jesus is going to mess with your stuff. And He does it so He can forgive you. Pray with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to touch every heart and every life that is here. I ask you to forgive sin on every hand. I ask you, God, today that if there is a need in this place, God, that it's not been made known to us, that, God, you would at least by your spirit let that be known, that you would touch every heart and every life that is here. And, God, whatever's being stirred in our heart, God, let us realize that it's not being stirred so that we feel condemned or aggravated or frustrated or defeated, but God is being stirred that if we bring that to you right now, you'll forgive our sin. And God, if we believe that there's no sin in our life, then God, even though we're not sinners, we have to understand we've displeased you and that's got to come out of our life. You've given us your grace that we might live in power above sin and beyond sin. But you've also assigned us an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, so that if we do sin, we can confess our sins. And you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So 
I ask you to forgive sin on every hand today. I ask you to let hearts begin to deal with you and confess. God, what people will confess to you right now in their heart and deal with right now, you won't speak out so that anyone else has to deal with it. I'm asking you, Lord, to do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Is there anybody here today that needs to be anointed and prayed for? Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Hope you were blessed by the presence of the Lord. If you were touched by today's service or you gave your heart to the Lord or you have a testimony you want to share with us, why don't you reach out to us. The contact information is on the screen, and we look forward to hearing from you. Until then, be blessed.